Good afternoon, and welcome to the Chesapeake Food Shed Networks, or CFN's, Network Development Series webinar. My name is Yona Sipos, and I direct the program development of the Chesapeake Food Shed Network through Local Concepts LLC, a consulting firm providing the development and backbone support of the CFN. I'm joined today by Christy Gabbard, the owner of Local Concepts and the network coordinator for the CFN. We're also joined by Sonia Kainer, who's CFN's new outreach coordinator. Before we jump into the webinar that we're all very much looking forward to, I'll provide a very brief overview of the CFN. The Chesapeake Food Shed Network is a group of organizations, businesses, funders, agencies, and other change agents working across the Chesapeake watershed to build a stronger and more resilient food system. We're a relatively new initiative, about two years in the making, and the leadership that spurred the network's development did so because they recognized the great deal of extraordinary work being done across the Chesapeake watershed to advance our regional food system. But what was lacking was an entity intentionally trying to build connections, trust, and relationships among those out there doing the work. So the mission of the CFN is to catalyze connections and collaborations that help build a sustainable, resilient, inclusive, and equitable regional food system in the Chesapeake Bay watershed. We believe that by catalyzing connections and collaborations, we're stronger together, such that we can help to accelerate change in our food system. We encourage conversation and connection in various ways, including social media. Please note the um, hashtags and usernames at the, on the slide footers, and uh, we hope to see you on, uh, on Twitter. This here is a picture of our network building blocks. The foundation of our network is all about building connections, getting to know one another, sharing information and knowledge, and building relationships and trust with the idea that as we know one another better, we might over time see opportunities for alignment and working toward collective action. We invite anyone who supports our vision of a sustainable, resilient, inclusive, and equitable regional food system to participate in the Chesapeake Food Shed Network. So the network development series is a relatively new series that includes education, support for strengthening the network, and opportunities to grow organizational capacity. It includes webinars such as this one, in-person meetings, regional tours, um, and other opportunities that create space to share lessons learned, hear from experts, and strengthen collective capacity and opportunity. Today's network development um, series webinar is an opportunity for all of us to dig into community ownership and food sovereignty and learn from some incredibly successful and innovative examples from the nation's capital in Washington DC. We are absolutely delighted that at last count over 150 people from across the US had registered for this webinar. The presenters today will be uh, Brandy Brooks and Chris Bradshaw from Dreaming Out Loud and Xavier Brown from Soilful City. And I'll introduce them in just a moment. Um, but first, I'll just note a couple of house housekeeping items around Zoom. This is a relatively new technology for the Chesapeake Food Shed Network. So thank you for your patience if there are any glitches. Um, you can uh, use your mouse to hover at the, probably at the bottom of your screen, it might be at the top, where a panel of options will pop up. And if you um, you should see options such as chat and the Q&A function. If you click on each of those, you'll be able to add comments to the chat box and your questions to the Q&A. And Christy will be collecting your questions throughout the webinar and will moderate the Q&A um, with the presenters following their presentation. Um, I should also say that within a few days of the webinar, we'll be sharing a recording of the presentation. So we will be recording this and any additional Q&A that we don't get to, as well as a post-webinar survey, which we would be grateful if you would fill out. So I now have the honor of introducing our speakers for today, and I'll start with um, Brandy Brooks, who is an activist, educator, facilitator, and designer who has spent more than 10 years on social and environmental justice. Her particular areas of focus include community engagement and empowerment, community-based design, land use planning, and food justice and food sovereignty. She was founding executive director of the Community Design Resource Center of Boston, has worked in senior management roles with the Rudy Bruner Foundation, the Food Project, the Boston Collaborative for Food and Fitness. Throughout Brandy's career, she has been committed to fostering and supporting the right to self-determination 
of urban communities of color and communities with low income levels by advocating for equitable representation, meaningful participation, and community-led decision-making in issues and projects that affect a community's built and natural environment. Chris Bradshaw is the executive director of, uh, and the founder of Dreaming Out Loud, and I should say that Brandy is the program director there. Um, Chris is an expert in bringing social innovation, youth development, and entrepreneurship, along with urban farming techniques, to underrepresented communities. Chris honed his organizing and entrepreneurial skills at Howard University while studying political science and business and developing a human rights-centered worldview as area coordinator for Amnesty International. His call to social organizing led him to leave Howard to form Dreaming Out Loud, Incorporated, or DOL, which fully embraces urban agriculture and cooperative social enterprise as mechanisms for changing communities. Um, Dreaming Out Loud has done incredible work in DC, and we're going to hear um, much of the much of today's presentation will be focused on on the work and successes there, um, as well as the work of Xavier Brown, who is with Soilful City. He's a native of Washington D.C., a graduate of North Carolina Ag, Ag and Tech State University, and current University of Vermont graduate student. Xavier operates at the boundaries of urban agriculture, environmental sustainability, and African diasporic culture. His work intertwines environmental um, sustainability <clears throat> with social justice issues that affect stressed communities from gun violence to mass incarceration to climate change. The guiding question is how the wisdom of nature and different ways of knowing can be used to dismantle these problems. Xavier views nature as a tool that can uplift and heal stressed communities. By studying the practices of indigenous people and going back to ancestral knowledge, Xavier is part of the new sustainability movement uh, that is healing the earth and the land by reconnecting our sacred relationship to the earth. We are over the moon, doesn't even cut it. We are honored and delighted to host these presenters today, these resource experts, um, so that we can learn from the incredible work that they're doing in DC. And with that, I will remind you to please put your questions in the question box. We encourage your engagement throughout the webinar, and I will turn it over now um, to, uh, to Brandy to start us off. Great, thank you so much, Yona, and thank you everyone for joining us today on the webinar. So my job as we get started is to set the stage for what we're going to talk about in terms of what community ownership in the food system means and how we get there. And I wanna start by talking about some difficult realities about our food system as it exists and has existed for the past five centuries. Blaine Snipstall is a local farmer here in the DC, Maryland and Virginia area working on the Eastern shore of Maryland, who's written a lot about agroecology. Um, and he's put out this statement, which I think is the key one that we need to wrestle with as we're talking about the food system today. The idea that the industrial food system that we, as we know it are, as well as our political and economic systems are really built on the exploitation of labor, uh, dispossession and exploitation of land, destruction of culture, consolidation of power and forced migration. We don't like to talk about this very much, that this is actually the platform upon which our food system is built. Um, and the challenge is that it's not only the platform, but it's actually the repeated pattern of how our food system continues to work even to the present day. One of the, some of the slides that you're gonna see in the next couple of minutes are slides that we used in an event called the Mid-Atlantic Agroecology Encounter, which took place this summer. And they were used as a kind of history walk about the food system. And one of the patterns that you see as you go through this history walk is that again and again, agricultural workers have been disenfranchised, have been deprived of their rights, have been exploited and dispossessed, and continuously remain vulnerable in our food system. This pattern starts right at the very beginning with the colonization and conquest in the Americas and the establish establishment of plantation architecture, I'm sorry, agriculture, and then the enslavement starting with the native peoples to begin the agricultural process in the United States. It continues, of course, with slavery. Uh, one of the big drivers for slavery was basically trying to find a way to get a labor force 
that could be worked extremely um, and in poor conditions and that was less likely to rebel. White indentured servants um, were not in that position and even, even Native Americans, because they were on their home territory and still had connections to their communities, were quite frankly harder to enslave. And so the idea of being able to transport people across the ocean into completely new environments where they were disconnected from land, culture, and their communities uh, made for what people thought was a really strong argument for continuing to enslave millions of Africans over the course of the first centuries of colonization and settlement in the Americas. Skipping ahead uh, toward where you look at the end of slavery, this pattern continues even then, where you see the extension of some recognition that there needed to be restitution for the theft of labor and the theft of land and community from slaves of African descent. But then you also see, and this is a continued pattern in our agriculture, the rescinding of a promise, the rescinding of that recognition, where with the Freedmen's Bureau, you have folks being able finally as slaves to secure some land, but then very quickly um, because of the pressures of racism and capitalism, that land is reclaimed by white plantation owners. And you also see a cycle throughout our agricultural history of new groups of people being brought into this pattern. So as African Americans began to move into other industries, as they had less opportunity in agriculture, you see Asian immigrants come in and start to become a huge part of the American agricultural labor force, to the point where by the end of the 19th century, seven out of every eight farm workers were Chinese. And then again, you see this stepping back, this reaction to the growth of population and power and skill among immigrants, people of color, poor people, with the Chinese Exclusion Acts, with the continuation of Jim Crow segregation. And you start to see a new group of workers come in. As Asians are barred from immigration in the United States, Mexicans are exempted from those laws and encouraged to come to the US. And this coincides with Asian workers here in the United States beginning to organize and build their power. And so again, people trying to supplant them with this new group so that that power could be broken. You also see how this is enacted, not simply in private transactions, but in public policy, through things like the exclusion of farm workers and domestic laborers, who again were primarily African Americans and immigrant groups, from key labor protections that would have granted them security around wages, um, around other aspects of compensation and labor protections, and around safety in their work environments. Once again, uh, after a time, the Mexicans were asked to go back to where they had come from, which is a theme that you see over and over again. And after Mexican families had come here and settled here and become part of the workforce, there's a forced migration of more than half a million of them um, back to Mexico during the 1930s and the Great Depression. And this continues even into more recent decades where you see, again, due to global violence through the Vietnam War. You see refugee farmers from Southeast Asia escaping those countries um, and coming to resettle in the United States, again, becoming part of the agricultural production system, but facing significant barriers, even as they contribute hugely um, to our food system in the United States. And again, as we talk about public policy, the routine enactment of policies that are designed to discriminate, to keep people um, from benefits and from participation um, in the agricultural workforce and agricultural ownership, um, whether it's African Americans, Native Americans, women, and Latinos. Um, the USDA has been sued by all of those groups related to its discriminatory policies. And so we come to today, most recently, where, um, again, once again, we're seeing farm workers coming primarily from immigrant groups in Latin America, although also from Asia and Central America and the Caribbean, who again are being exploited, are facing um, incredibly challenging and violent and abusive labor conditions, appallingly low wages, and are increasingly food insecure. And even in the cases where you have both um, white and non-white workers who are part of the system, there's continued pay discrimination, whether that's simply based on pay amounts or on differing kinds of jobs in the economy. So one of the key questions is why does all of this matter? 
Um, and I like to use this quote from George Santayana because I think it's critical as we think about what it takes to build an equitable food system going forward. Um, if we don't know and fully understand this history and how our agricultural system is built, then we cannot make the changes that we need to address it properly. And these things that we talk about don't just have historical impacts, but very significant present impacts. Whether we want to talk about diabetes and other chronic diseases that are related to both poverty and to the loss of traditional food ways, whether we want to talk about wealth and economic status um, and the way that dispossession of land has impacted Black, Latino, and other families in the United States, or whether we want to talk about the continuing um, exploitation of food worker populations, in particular this, this statistic about the percentage of Latinos in the U.S. population, but then their much higher representation in some of the most dangerous and most difficult jobs in our food system, farm work, fruit and vegetable processing, and animal processing, as well as food service. So looking at all of that history, we come to the question, what, what do we do now? How do we set our sights forward? And there has tended to be a, a core set of solutions that we've gone to when it comes to what it means to build a good food system. It's everything from focus on food access, nutrition education, health disparities, healthy school food, et cetera. And all of these things have very valuable and valid components to them. But the challenge is that none of them actually address the core issue that we see repeated throughout our food system history, which is the issue of power, of power over land and water, of power over labor, and of power over culture and history, the ability to even define what counts as appropriate food, what counts as an appropriate way to obtain your food, and what the actual history is of people relative to their land and their agricultural abilities. All of these things are things that poor people and people of color have historically been excluded from power over. And this is the issue that's at the core of our food system. So if we want to shift to a food system that truly is equitable and just, then we need to address these questions of power. And this is where the framework of food sovereignty comes in. Um, there are a couple of different definitions used by different groups. But the core focus in each of them uh, is that food, one, is a human right, is for people, and that the production of food for people, not for trade, not for the building of capital, is the core point of our food system. The idea of local control of the food system, of land and water, of local knowledge and capacity, the idea that what we do needs to harmonize and work with nature, not to downgrade it, not to lose biodiversity or cause ecological catastrophe. And again, looking at our policies where we, in fact, due to the focus on food as a commodity, as a point of trade, um, actually globalize hunger through the policies that currently drive our food system. And lastly, that everyone needs to be free from violence, from displacement and from poverty um, in their daily lives and certainly as a routine part of participating in the food system. Agroecology is basically the way the system of practices that puts food sovereignty into practice. Via Campesina is among many different groups around the world that focus on agroecology um, and food sovereignty. And this idea that you value and prioritize the combination of knowledge, not only scientific and technical knowledge, but the knowledge of communities about their societies and about their environments that has been used to feed people throughout history. And when you look at these two frames, there are a couple of core things to recognize. One, that both are explicitly political in their analysis. We tend to associate that with partisanship, but what it means is that these take a systemic look at what happens in the food system. They look not solely at interpersonal interactions, but at our culture, our institutions, our public policies, and the way that they manifest the food system that we have today. Food sovereignty and agroecology are grounded in the experience, needs, and aspirations of poor people and people of color who are currently marginalized in the food system. These folks are the drivers um, because they are the ones facing the most serious impacts and on the front line of how our food system works. 
and it is about restoring power and control to those people from whom it has routinely been denied in our food system history. And as we do that, we accomplish truthful and authentic healing, solidarity and liberation as understood and as verified by the people who have been oppressed. So it's not a false unity or false healing, but one that truly addresses and restores people um, on all the various levels of their humanity. And so now I'm going to turn things over to Xavier to be able to talk about some concrete examples of how food sovereignty and agroecology are being put into place today. Cool. Thank you, Brandy, and uh, thank everyone for joining us uh, this afternoon. So my uh, present, my section of the presentation is going to co cover the uh, Federation of Southern Cooperatives, kind of give a historical perspective on kind of uh, what Brandy was talking about around Black farmers and uh, Black people who work with the land in the South uh, seizing power and, and organizing you know, uh, ways to collectively, uh, you know, gain control of uh, economic uh, realities. And so I just wanted to kick it off with this, this quote from Ben Burkett. He's a farmer in Mississippi, uh, and he's a part of the uh, Federation of Southern Cooperatives. And I think this quote kind of encapsul encapsules uh, everything uh, that we're kind of talking about uh, as it pertains to agroecology, as it pertains to food sovereignty, as it pertains to kind of collective work and responsibility and, and what we're all working for. So the Federation of Southern Cooperatives was founded in 1967. So it was 50 years old, uh, you know, this year. Um, it's a, right now, it's a, it's a 501c3 nonprofit, and it's composed of uh, 75 cooperatives, credit unions, and community-based economic development groups across the South. And so it goes, uh, starts up here in DC, all the way down to Florida, over to Louisiana and Texas. Uh, the cooperative, the, the cooperative was kind of started uh, during the civil rights movement, and, and people were recognizing that a lot of the uh, uh, the things that were going on with the civil rights movement, they really weren't talking about the economics. And a lot, a big thing for uh, down there with the farmers was that it was land loss. So since uh, 1920, there's been over 12 million acres of land that have been lost for African American farmers. Cool. So the membership uh, includes 10,000 black, black farm families who own over a half a million acres of land. And so as you can see, that half a million acres is, is a huge decrease from the over 15 million acres that was owned uh, back in 1920. So there's over 35 agricultural cooperatives, you know, they purchase supplies, they provide education, technical assistance, um, training on how to save your money, how to market things collectively, credit unions, all different ways to kind of maximize their collective ability to kind of get to the market, to work together, to educate, educate each other, and to build a, a autonomy amongst each other. Cool. So there's six major themes that the, uh, the Southern uh, cooperatives, they kind of focus on and how they judge their success. So the first one is to de develop cooperative credit unions as a means for people to enhance the quality of their lives and improve their communities. Second one, to save and protect, expand the land holdings of black family farmers and other disadvantaged farmers in the South. So in addition to working with black farmers, uh, the Southern Cooperative Federation of Farmers works with uh, Native American farmers, and they also work with poor white farmers, women farmers as well. 
So to develop a unique and effective rural training and research center in Epps, Alabama, to provide information, skills, and awareness and cultural context to help our members constituents to build strong rural communities. So uh, the education is a big part of it. Um, as you saw with Brandon's presentation on agroecology, a big part of moving things forward is uh, political education, cultural education. To promote and develop safe, sanitary, and affordable housing opportunities for our members in rural communities, to develop advocate and support public policies to benefit our members of black and other family farmers and other low-income rural communities where they live and so this is uh important as well as you'll see in, in the slides coming they, they offer classes on uh, advocacy and policy and how they can work you know collectively to shape policy that will benefit them to develop sustainable and financial self-supporting cooperative business development including an endowment fund to support our ongoing work that cannot be fully funded by membership fees so a lot of the work that we do uh, with soulful with dreaming out loud and other organizations black dirt farm uh, black dirt, the black dirt farm um, collective is uh ways that we can work together to market our things and so a lot of what we're doing now is off of the playbook that the uh, southern cooperatives have already written for us and so we're kind of learning from the past And so this is a, a list of the learn, leadership and development education kind of sections that they have. And it's organizing. So getting people together with similar problems and needs to meet together to discuss the needs and common problems. This is something that we all do in DC. Um, education. We offer a lot of educational programs. And I'm just showing ways that the work that we do in DC currently mirrors the uh, work that the Southern cooperatives have been doing for the last 50 years. So education is a big part of it. Um, analyzing community needs and examining the cooperative principles and practices as a means of tackling the problems. Savings, so being able to, uh, you know, pool funds and resources towards developing cooperative business solutions to the problems um, in action. So, you know, the implementation of all of the things that they've been working on previously and putting them into action. And so really uh, taking this process and, and repeating it and then adjusting, you know, when you learn the things. So, we are, in DC, we're definitely using this uh, on a consistent basis. And so this is just to give you a look, uh, in the, since the last 50 years, since the organization has been around, just the economic impact that they've had. There's $85 million in sales through cooperative marketing, 25 million members share saving credit union, uh, 30 million worth of housing units constructed and rehabilitated, 75 million, mobilized, uh, 75 million mobilized and resources uh, for supports of member cooperatives and credit unions and 100 mil million worth of land saved and retained. So these are some pretty major numbers um, to have been accomplished and, and you know, and done in 50 years. So uh, it's definitely inspiring for us. So I'm gonna pass it over to Chris. All right, thank you, Xavier and appreciate everyone for joining us today. All right, so let's talk Black Dirt Farm Collective. Uh, as Xavier mentioned, um, all of us young folks, as they call us, are working on uh, some frameworks and some solutions that have been passed down, strategies that are still relevant today, and we wanna build upon that. Uh, one of the uh, organizations here uh, in the, region that are working really hard uh, building upon that historical legacy is the Black Dirt Farm Collective, uh, which was founded in 2003 and is about 80 miles southeast of Baltimore, uh, located on two acres of land where Hub Harriet Tubman once rescued her parents and nine others from enslavement in this place, which is one of the first stops on the Underground Railroad. Uh, and this collective is made up of farmers, Black farmers from Baltimore, Philadelphia, and D.C. And Black Dirt Farm is one of the pioneers of a, a term called Afroecology, which takes the two different words and, and, and combines them for a powerful uh, statement. Um, Aaliyah Frazier, one of the founders, calls uh, Afroecology um, 
that it's a call back to the land that is awaiting our return. It is the living, breathing process of decolonization that is built upon the Black experience of indigenous Africans becoming indigenized, uh, diasporic Africans. Our indigenous reality cannot be recreated, but it can also not be forgotten because we, as indigenized peoples, have the unique ability to create and determine our reality using our wildest imaginations and ancestral knowledge as fuel. Afroecology is a, a form of art, movement, uh, practice, and process of social and ecological transformation. So in that, we aren't leaving out uh, one aspect. It's combining things in a, in a holistic manner that involves the reevaluation of our sacred relationships with land, water, air, seeds, and food uh, that re-recognizes uh, humans as co-creators that are an aspect of the planet's life and support systems. We aren't uh, deposited here, we are a part of the system. Um, Af Afroecology values the Afro-Indigenous experience of reality and ways of knowing, cherishes ancestral and communal forms of knowledge, experience, and life ways that began in Africa and continue throughout the diaspora and is rooted in the agrarian traditions, legacies, and struggles of the Black experience in the Americas. One of the ways that we uh, work with Black Dirt Farm at Dreaming Out Loud in Soilful City, uh, as well as the ARC Farm and our, our co-practitioners of Afroecology is by actually getting out into the communities that uh, we work in and work with. Uh, this past spring, uh, 2016, we had a, a series where we progressed through three different communities, working to connect folks uh, through our uh, reconnection with the land, uh, our communal uh, uh, practices together in terms of coming together and, and accomplishing goals and tasks, but also the technical knowledge and skills training that helps us to uh, be more productive in the spaces that we occupy and gives us a stronger basis to do work in communities when you're visible in the community and the community is a part of uh, reforming and reshaping spaces. And as we mentioned, Afroecology is a, a social methodology. It, it, it requires both theory and practice. Uh, social movement and political ideologies that reframe the narrative around agriculture and land, meaning reframing how we believe uh, land is to be used. It's reframing the way that we discuss land use, public land use, and even its dispensation uh, amongst our uh, city officials. So Afroecology might say that, no, we aren't building a community garden here uh, until there comes time for development as defined by developers. This practice of putting into uh, spaces uh, productive uh, communal spaces is actually development, is holistic human development. Uh, Agroecology seeks to reframe those uh, and, and challenge those existing narratives about land's use, uh, extending the process of social transformation into spaces within communities. Um, Afroecology is about the revitalization of campesino and ancestral indigenous knowledge. Um, there's a story that a friend of mine tells about how um, when folks were ripped from their homelands in the African continent, that women actually would hide seeds in their hair and transport them to the new world. So we're talking about re, uh, rediscovering a part of ourselves that will allow us to uh, uh, recognize a brighter future um, and, and revitalizing communal forms of knowledge and, and, and putting that into practice in, 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 in our modern times. Farmer to farmer training, all of those parts are pieces of the practice of, of Afroecology. And as you can see, it's intergenerational, it's farmer to farmer, it is very real on the ground. But we also realized that um, as we are doing this work, self care and collective self care is important. We have uh, get togethers, we have um, uh, times to enjoy each other socially and get to know each other on that level, but we also take the the technical piece and training uh, very very seriously. Um, as you can see from this slide, there are lots of techniques that we work to uh, uh, use to restore the soil uh, to uh, again uh, bring about a holistic agro agroecological 
perspective on, on farming and food and communities. Yeah, and as you can see, the soil health is a huge part of that. Um, we work to bring folks together in mass as well, so that we are able to uh, collectively share these experiences and bring them to other spaces. Um, one thing that we look forward to doing is uh, at Dreaming Out Loud as we're launching a two acre farm and food hub in Ward 7 this year is bringing more folks to the urban space where we help happen to occupy, but also extending to our rural brothers and sisters um, and connecting those dots so folks can, can see how uh, both struggles are, are, are intertwined. And so that's the, the crux of uh, agroecology. Um, that was the two six, 2016 Mid-Atlantic Gathering. We look forward to building uh, upon that legacy and up, upon the, the groundwork that's been done and, and convening more and more folks nationally and internationally um, in the spaces that we occupy and, and advancing this, this movement. And with that, I can give it back over to you, Brandy. Yeah, absolutely. So what we wanna close with in talking about these examples is, is that when we talk about what a good and just and sustainable food system means for people of color, people of low incomes, indigenous people, not only in the United States, but from around the world, it's a slightly different conversation than a lot of the conversations that we have around the food system. Um, in sort of the US food movement mainstream. They are conversations absolutely about personal health, about soil health, um, about strong economies, but they layer some very critical political analyses um, and draw solutions based on the experiences that our communities have had in the food system and the things that we see need to happen in order to make that food system truly restorative. What you're seeing here is a declaration that came from the 2016 Mid-Atlantic Agroecology Encounter. Um, and I won't read all of it, but I want to just acknowledge the calling out of white supremacy, of heteropatriarchy, of capitalism as systems, not solely interpersonal interactions that are shaping the way that our food system works and that are degrading it um, for all of us, in fact, not just for people of color. And so the solutions that we look to um, are based in a respect for the earth, are based in bringing the wisdom and knowledge that has been passed through people and their cultures and their land throughout many, many generations all across the world. Um, and again, are creating structures and methods and frameworks that are focused on liberation, that are focused on people being truly free and healthy um, and able to live their lives fully in this world and doing that through the food system because it is the most basic system that we all create with one another. Um, it includes, again, just as the food sovereignty principles mentioned, reclaiming land. Um, it includes having conversations like this about systems of oppression and how they operate in our food system. Um, it includes building the capacity of our communities to exercise their power um, and to reshape their food systems differently. Um, and to create spaces um, where we all are able to be as whole and healed people with a whole and healed earth. So what does that mean as we think about what we all do as policymakers and advocates and funders and workers in this food system? So uh, pro tips seems to be a big thing uh, on the internet these days. So I decided I'd come up with a few when it comes to community ownership in the food system. And the first one, is about community leadership and control. Again, the core issue in our food system is about power. And we need to shift power if we are going to actually have a just food system, which means that members of affected communities lead and direct initiatives, that they determine what success looks like for food systems initiatives based on the things that they see as the needs in their communities. And this is something that we intentionally have to practice and repractice and retrain ourselves in over and over again. Um, because the cultural and institutional systems that we work in are not designed to yield power back to these communities. Second, we have to recognize that food issues do not happen in silos and we have to think intersectionally. Food touches every aspect of our society, housing, 
economic justice, environment, land and water, immigration, education, police reform. You want to talk about any issue in our society, there's a relationship to food. And frequently, if you actually want to address the food challenges that a community is having, then you need to also be looking sometimes in very different places at some of these other challenges first. And lastly, and this is one of the most difficult ones for all of us, and I include myself, um, I would assume that everyone on this call matches one of these categories on the left here, which means that all of us have some work that we need to do um, because all of us are in some way considered part of a dominant group in our society. And we are trained to expect that we should be in power, that we should exercise control over other people and over resources. We're trained that we deserve that. And we have to start unpacking that um, and retraining ourselves to understand that that system of domination um, is based on falsehoods about who we believe we are as people um, and that it needs to be confronted and reformed in order to actually build a just and sustainable food system. It's challenging work, but we can do it and we are doing it in our communities every day. So um, as we're all going through in this relearning process, there are resources that can help ground us in what it means to build a food system that is based on food sovereignty and agroecology. Many of these resources were shared by Yona in the lead up to the webinar, and they'll be available linked through this presentation and shared uh, later as well. Um, but these are readings and definitions that are coming from communities around the world about what it looks like for them to have a healed food system. And these are the same principles that we use here in the DC metro area to build out food sovereignty and agroecology for our communities. And with that, I want to thank you all again for joining us and pause so that we can go into questions. Brandy, Xavier, and Chris, wow. Thank you so very much for the informative presentations, everything from grounding us in history to the examples with your organization to Brandy, the, the pro tips, so helpful and we, um, just very much appreciate, I very much appreciate your time in pulling this together and sharing it through the webinar. We have um, a few uh, different questions and comments that I would like to start with. Um, one is from George, who uh, said he's been studying Gandhi, he has been studying Gandhian economics, a way of thinking through a nonviolent non-exploitative economic system and have been wondering whether those concepts as well as an update of his constructive program for improving Indian villages might be useful in the USA today for both rural and urban communities. Um, do you guys care to comment on that? And if you, and just to note, Chris and Xavier, you're, you're both on mute if, if you do care to comment. Well, I'm actually not very familiar with Gandhian economics, but um, just from the brief description that you uh, gave us, I think that that's absolutely uh, applicable. Uh, Nonviolent, non-exploitative. If you look at our current system, um, the way that uh, migrant workers are exploited, uh, you don't have to travel uh, far away to find that. Uh, one of our anchor farm partners that we've worked with through at Dreaming Out Loud, who uh, was one of the first farms to take a chance on us in establishing a farmer's market at uh, the Unity Healthcare Clinic on Minnesota Avenue in Ward 7 in Northeast Washington, DC. Uh, the name of our farm partner is Crazy Farm, and they are a first generation Mexican American family in Westmoreland County, Virginia. And if you drive to, um, that county and that rich farmland there's there's tons of farms down there but if you pay attention to the large aggregators on any given day you can see a school bus full of what are likely undocumented workers who are piled onto buses and then um, bust out to the farms to harvest the the, the crops um, if you sit down and have family dinner and listen to the stories of how workers are treated and how um, they exploit them in terms of their wages. Um, you don't have to travel far to see that, but I think you can look across the globe for ways that communities have resisted and organized to uh, impact uh, circumstances such as that. So um, 
any resistance strategies that you can glean from uh, from Gandhi and from a, a non-exploitative, non-violent way of resisting, I think are amazing. Absolutely, and I would add to that simply that there are, we didn't get a chance to cover all of the various ways that people are resisting here in the US um, and across the globe. We were only able to offer a couple of examples because of the limited time that we have, but one of the things that I think doesn't get enough uh, play in talking about the US food system is that there are many, many different examples of ways that people are resisting uh, the current food system and rebuilding new ones um, from all across Asia, Africa, South America, North America, Europe. Um, and I think what we need to be doing is to be looking at those examples for what we can learn, not a nostalgic, looking back to some false past, but really a critical looking at the examples that we see of how people have been building healthier ways of living together and living with the land and understanding how we bring those forward into today. And also understanding what systems we have today that we need to dismantle because they do not produce health and wellness for ourselves and our planet. Thank you. Uh, I did want to note that George, George uh, said that he, he has made notes on uh, the readings in Gandhian economics and, um, and that they're available at, and we will share his blog spot uh, URL uh, in the follow-up material so other folks can access his notes on those, those readings. Thank you very much, George. Uh, another question from one of the viewers is, uh, I am interested to hear about some of the struggles you all face in accessing power in DC or other examples that seem relevant to local food system professionals slash workers in the US fighting for more equity in the local food system. Ooh. <laughs> Let's see. Um, there are a lot of places to start with this. I will uh, I think build off of one that Chris mentioned in passing as he was giving uh, his portion of the presentation. I think one of the critical barriers that we have here in the US is our attitude toward land and property. Um, and the way that we think about private property and how it should be disposed, and even the way that we think about public property and how it becomes disposed for private benefit. Um, we have a lot of hangups around land and property in the United States. And what it means is that we are often locked in this system of privatization, of enclosure, um, and of disrespect for the folks around us because of what we think that private land means. Um, and we are also just driven to use land to maximize profit, uh, which is not at all the same thing as maximizing health or well being or overall prosperity um, for the broader community. So, there are a lot of policies that I think we can look at in both urban and rural areas in terms of what we think highest and best uses of land are um, and what the processes are by which we make decisions about land use because I think there's just so much in there um, that acts as a barrier to people being able to access the land and the water that we need um, in order to be able to survive and thrive, not only in terms of food, but also housing and a number of other issues. Um, I would definitely like to add, uh, from my perspective, um, I guess a struggle or, or something to really think about is when you're trying to access power, um, you can't do it as an individual or two, two people or three people. It takes a, a community of people. And so the three of us represent a larger network of farmers, academics, community people, community organizers, a whole bunch of different people. And so um, it's important to, to build your, your, your internal networks and really build relationships with people um, and understand that it takes time to kind of get to where you want to be. And so it's not going to be like a year process or a two year mm -hmm. process. It might be five years, you know. Um, so just kind of yeah. putting perspective and like really um, be willing to work with that um, and be willing to work with people and build relationships. So. Yeah, I'd also say another uh, important word in accessing and building power is trust. You know, as, as Xavier said, we're, you know, you see three faces, but there are many more of us, but that process of trust building is what Xavier was, you know, referencing and, and as, as, as a huge part. Um, 
whether that's amongst folks who are doing the most organizing or folks within the community who uh, are witness your organizing, um, they have to know that you come from a genuine place, what your politics are and what your um, values are. So building power around shared values is really important. And, you know, like Xavier said, it takes time to build that trust and that power and to, you know, round out the values uh, that, that make up, um, you know, power, accessed and then used properly. And I think that there's not enough value given um, in terms of funding, in terms of time, to that organizing work and how necessary it is. Yeah, relationships are key and it is through that organizing work that relationships are built. Um, thank you. The th thank you all three of you for your comments there. Uh, Renee has a question. Uh, what should consumers of local food be asking about farm worker conditions? Are there resources for knowing about local farms that are doing the right thing in terms of worker rights? Also, any resources for locating local farms owned by people of color? And um, just real quick before you comment, I did want to point out that uh, Jessica Culley's organization, Kata Farm Workers, did a presentation for us and talked to some of these uh, questions or provided information regarding some of these questions. And we will follow up with a link to that presentation um, in the follow up materials. Great, and, and in some cases, I would, I would defer to organizations like CASA, which are organizing and are part of networks across the country um, where farm workers are organizing to push back against the, the conditions and the wages that they're given right now. There are certification programs like, I believe it's called the Agricultural Justice Project, and that I think is run in part by CASA along with other allies, which is designed to, to help to certify and be able to give people information about uh, the farms and food uh, organizations or operations that are actually sustainably treating um, both people and the earth. Um, and there are other resources like that, but Kata is a great place to start um, when you wanna look at farm worker conditions. Um, the Food Chain Workers Alliance is another great organization um, focusing more, I think, on the service industry, but there's some intersection between the two groups. And do you guys care to comment or do you know of any resources for locating local farms owned by people of color? Well, um, Blavity is a, a online platform that curated a list. Um, there are, well, that's a primary one I know of. I, don't, I would also maybe check the Federation of Southern Cooperatives. Um, SAFON, which is the um, an organic uh, certification collective of, of, of black farmers. Um, I would also take a look at the Black Urban Growers um, website, the Bugs website. Uh, they uh, highlight and, and discuss black farmers there. So I think those are some good places to start. You can kind of start to uh, discover more from there. Yeah, and, and I was going to say that the National Black Farmers Association, um, they probably, I'm pretty sure they have some resources as well. Yeah. yeah, we'll make sure to share uh, those organizations' names and links to their website in the follow-up materials also. Uh, here are a few clarification questions for the three of you. Uh, uh, you so there's three questions, and, um, and one is you speak of people being oppressed, and this person would like uh, more information on how people are being oppressed today. Um, you speak of the shifting of power. Who has the power today and how should it be shifted? And can you define dominant groups in our society today and who these groups are? So um, how about we just start with the first one and, and I'm happy to share the others after that. Um, so how are people being oppressed today? So I, I can start uh, talking about this one. I, I think there are multiple angles. One of the easiest ones to start with is to look at the way that people of color are disproportionately represented in low wage and are highly dangerous um, as well. Food system jobs, um, particularly if you look at Latino immigrants 
And there are a whole bunch of systems that factor into this, including uh, exclusion due to race, due to language, um, due to the way that we recognize education between countries uh, that happens in this group when people come here. Um, there's a whole conversation that's probably too complex for right now that we need to have about immigration policy and trade policy and how we create with international policy the conditions that make it so that people um, cannot make good livelihoods uh, back in their home countries and then come to the United States uh, seeking opportunities but face a lot of barriers uh, again in terms of being able to find legitimate employment and yet when they do come, uh, there are many, many different kinds of organizations that are happy to take advantage of those folks, to pay them less, less uh, to house them in ways that are deplorable, um, to abuse, uh, to assault workers. Uh, so that's one dimension that we could talk about when it comes to ways that people are oppressed in the food system. You could also talk about um, the way that communities of color uh, in urban centers have historically been concentrated in areas that uh, have been denied key amenities, uh, again, denied access to both uh, land and housing and employment opportunities where companies have chosen to disinvest from those places um, and where when people look at where they should put different kinds of food establishments or different kinds of uh, environmental resources or environmental hazards in communities. Um, they target communities of color for worse food, for higher environmental hazards. Um, so that's another example of how these systems of oppression work. And I think a key to understanding all of this is one, to take an accurate look at history um, and to really to seek to understand uh, some of the hidden history that isn't spoken about in the United States when it comes to these issues, as well as um, looking at the multiple factors that are in play that shape people's environments and the choices that they have access to. Uh, the myth of the bootstraps and the anyone can make it in the United States is belied by the way that our economic and political and environmental and educational systems actually work. Thanks, Brandy. Yeah, I'd also add, you know, you mentioned shifting the power um, those who want to maintain systems of oppression have one particular type of power that I think we don't uh, talk about, which is the power of definition and the power to shape narratives. So if you want to maintain uh, a system of oppression, um, you can have a, a framing where accessing affordable health care is oppression. Right, because <laughs> and then uh, resistance against um, uh, state-sponsored police violence is um, is actually destroying institutions and 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 oppressing someone. Right, the 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 ones who have the power want to define resistance to the system that maintains their power as as the actual problem rather than um, the the system itself. So I think uh, shifting the power means shifting the narrative and the conversation about what systems of, pre of oppression are or even it helping to acknowledge their even existence, because I think that's where we are now. So we have two minutes left, and I suspect these three questions could warrant a very, very long conversation on their own. Um, we've also been uh, shared a number of other questions that we will uh, make sure the panelists, the resource experts receive, and we will follow up with you, um, with the presenters, with that information, uh, your answers to their questions. And, and, and I did see someone, Danella, had asked if we could do a deeper dive, a webinar that does a deeper dive in international trade and immigration policy. Um, we could potentially do that, yes, and we would love to hear other ideas of where folks are very interested in kind of getting more information, learning more. Um, the webinars that we offer through the Chesapeake Food Shed Network are focused on where there's need and interest, so please let us know what would be of uh, value to you. Um, again, before Yona takes over, I do wanna thank uh, Xavier, Chris, and, and Brandy so much for the time today, and uh, sorry we didn't and have more time to get more uh, deeper into this, but uh, just tells me we need to schedule that in the future. Uh, thank you very much. Well, thank you all. I appreciate you all having us. And
putting this together. Yeah, thanks. Same. Wonderful. And just one more round of thank yous and gratitude to our resource experts and presenters. And clearly there is interest and need to go deeper and to keep, you know, this is just the very, very beginning um, of an entry point to these rich and, and um, essential topics within food systems. And so um, I'm excited just to bring your attention to the emerging work group of the Chesapeake Food Shed Network that's focused on community ownership, empowerment, and prosperity. And if you sign up for our email list or you follow us on social media, and of course follow our presenters as well, um, then the CFN will be releasing more information about the Emerging Work Group and also later in 2017 calls for co-chairs and work group members and other interested part, uh, potential participants in the work of, of also developing a regional perspective on on these issues um, that are also rooted in the local, I'll say. Um, uh, we also, I just wanted to draw your attention to um, the previous Coffee Talk webinar that Christy mentioned on sustainable agriculture with or without labor that we hosted er, uh, last year with Kata, which is the Farm Worker Support uh, Committee. And that webinar is posted on our CFN YouTube channel and we'll include the link as well as all the resources that our presenters put up and some of the other um, resources that were mentioned during the presentation. Um, we'll also be sending out the recording and the links to the slide deck and other resources, as well as a follow-up survey that we would, I'll just mention again, be very grateful for you to fill out. Uh, we'll be sending that um, probably early next week. And um, I'll just mention that in addition to the ideas that we heard today, we'd love to hear other ideas for future webinars, either that are focused on specific food system topics, which we call our coffee talks, or that are focused more on network development and collective capacity. Um, there are just a couple of events that uh, we have coming up that we've posted here, but please send other ideas to Christy. Be in touch. We'd love to hear about what you're working on and um, where you see the necessary work that, that we all need to collectively be contributing toward. So we're going to end there. Thank you so much for your participation. Thank you again to the resource expert presenters and um, wish you all a good afternoon and a good week.